Uh, we're back with, uh, G with Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Today we're, we're drilling down on uh, Black Lives Matter and we're drilling also down more, more broadly on uh, anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, and so we have uh, Mark Dollinger. He's uh, an historian in the West Coast uh, and you're a professor at what school, Mark? I'm a professor at San Francisco State University. I teach in the Department of Jewish Studies. Uh, wonderful. And our, our old friend, Peter Hoffenberg, who is professor of history uh, here in Honolulu at UH Manoa. Welcome to you both. So let's talk about Black Lives Matter for a minute. Uh, you know, we didn't have a big Black Lives Matter uh, march here in Honolulu. Um, neither Peter nor I uh, really had the opportunity to attend. But Mark, you were involved, at least in, in some degree. What did you find? Yeah, you know, I, I got to tell you, both, you know, as, as a person living through this and as an historian who studies this, it's remarkable. The Black Lives Matter protests are popping up everywhere in the country in places you'd never imagine. It appears to be going without even sort of organized leadership. It's sort of everyone just jumping in for the cause. And when I'm looking at the TV screens, I'm noticing intergenerational, interracial, interfaith. It's, sort of, it's a broad-based coalition of folks who are engaged in some really serious and hard-hitting issues around institutional racism. Um, here where I live in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I went out for a, for a, a rally and uh, they're basically sort of, you know, at, at the red light with the stop signs and the cars and, and passing out leaflets and and uh, even in a white suburban neighborhood where, where I am, it was extraordinary the number of people who showed up. But why? Why were they there? Why was this polyglot group there? It wasn't only because of George Floyd, was it? Yeah, so my sense is we had uh, several factors sort of colliding together. Um, sadly, of course, George Floyd is not the first black man to be killed by police, nor even the first one to be to be filmed. Uh, I think uh, COVID had a lot to do with this, with the in fact that folks are at home, they're reflective, they're thinking about mortality, there's a lot of nerves. I think uh, Trump's America has inspired a whole lot of people to get engaged in political activism. The, from the immigration protests uh, almost four years ago, the idea that people would leave their house and sort of just go out to the airports uh, and, and do that. Um, and then the upcoming election, I think, was giving a sense of urgency. So when you put all those together, I think it was the right combination for a transformation in attitude and, and, and even thinking about what our attitudes are going to be around around these issues. Well, th then we had, uh, you know, a kind of strange end to it. I'm not sure you can say it's over, but um, where, you know, for, mm, gee, it was, must have been six weeks in, uh, in Portland, uh, where there was, uh, you know, First Amendment protest and demonstration. All of a sudden, Trump brought in his, uh, his brown shirts. And before you know it, uh, there was violence. Um, now I think they negotiated a, a, a settlement between him and the, either the governor or the mayor or both uh, in Portland. Um, but that changes things, doesn't it? Can you talk about how that may change things um, for Black Lives Matter, for protests in, in, you know, in America and, and as those things may affect the election? Oh yeah, so thank you. It really ups the temperature and the stress and the stakes. Because what we have here to begin with are federal authorities at odds with state and local authorities. And traditionally, historically, when, when I study civil rights movements, the only time federal authorities move in against state or local authorities is to preserve and protect equal rights because they perceive that the local authorities are violating them. Now we have a situation where it's inverted, where we have the local officials doing what they can to engage Black Lives Matter in, in what they think will be responsible and nonviolent. And now we have a federal authority, which is, which is on the opposite side politically, which is now being perceived as an instigator of, of, of the greater potential for harm. Because my understanding in Portland is, as soon as these sort of unmarked federal agents came out, the number of protests increased and the intensity increased almost as if that was a provocation. So now we're seeing not only the political, the, making it political, but we're also seeing a, a, a break between federal and local law enforcement. And, and this, this really makes me nervous. Oh, well, it could lead to uh, de facto or de jure martial law. That's what it could lead to. And if it leads to that around the time before, during, or after the election, we really have a 
problem in our hands. So, Peter, you've been listening, right? How are we doing so far? And what are your thoughts so far in this discussion? Well, my main thought is thanks, Mark, for joining us. And I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad we, we, we picked on you. Uh, your expertise, not just in Jewish history, but, but civil rights. And uh, the only things I would add, I think uh, Mark covered it uh, beautifully, is that not only is this provoking uh, increased protest, but it's also provoking uh, protest and participation from at least demographically some groups that President Trump would need. So for example, we've seen organized veterans. I think the, the feds uh, breaking the arm of the Navy veteran will be a, a memorable moment. The guy who comes up, he's over 50, uh, he's peaceful. He just asks them what they were doing. Uh, they pepper spray him. Um, I'm not gonna go into Bill Barr's semantics about what exactly was sprayed, but certainly something that probably is covered by the Geneva Convention. So I would add that, I mean, you're absolutely right, not just that, in fact, protests have increased, but some of the demographics. And I think that the images of uh, mothers and fathers, uh, at least from a European perspective, uh, is very much like the successful campaign against uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, that proved to be, at least in Britain, a very successful campaign. And one of the uh, attributes of public protest there was, of course, for moms to get out. And one of the few times, um, you know the Jewish tradition, if you refer to Hitler, you lose the argument. So let's consider this a conversation, not an argument. Uh, one of the few successful expressions of public protest in Germany was, in fact, um, uh, with Christian uh, women who had married Jewish men. And they staged a very famous march and forced the authorities for at least that moment to step down. Um, the only other uh, thing I, I think I would, would add is that not only are the federal troops attacking protesters, it's quite clear they're also not protecting protesters. Most of the protesters, uh, you and I went to Berkeley, so we know that 98 out of every 100 protester is just taking a break from studying and is going to go to Top Dog. And there are five or six Trotskyites or Leninists, right, who are going to throw a bottle. And that's just the nature of uh, protests. Uh, and I was very disappointed to see that, for example, cars are speeding into protesters without any protection for the protesters. Uh, that certain, and I guess we should be careful with our terms, but at least say on the right armed protesters are threatening to go. So I see, regardless of your partisanship, I, I see another argument that there are simply too many guns in America. There are armed black lives groups. One can't blame them, right? <laughs> and one of the reasons, as you well know, that uh, African-Americans uh, supported the Second Amendment during Reconstruction was they didn't want the guns only to be in white hands. But the sign of African-Americans with guns, the sign with uh, camouflaged white veterans with guns, a guy who shows up with his disabled girlfriend with guns, they're really, it's another example, they're just too many weapons that are accessible in our society. And that's the kind of militarization I don't think he's been talked about. That society is militarized, not, not just the government. But thank you, Mark. I mean, I really, uh, we have five or six hours. We're not going to let you go. Yeah, uh, right. you're, you're definitely, Mark's the man. Miles to go before we sleep. So you talked about the polyglot nature, Mark, of uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and, you know, that means, um, you know, at least theoretically, everybody is under the same tent. Uh, and all believing in the uh, civil rights movement and uh, West Point's violence uh, and all. But, but query, is it truly polyglot? Is it truly everybody under the tent? Uh, were there contentions there and, and um, you know, groups within that group uh, that are arguing with each other about things? Yeah, thank you. I'd say actually both are true, right? Because it is by definition polyglot because uh, Black Lives Matter as a slogan and a larger movement is bringing in lots of different civil rights groups, social justice groups from lots of places, plus a whole lot of individuals who are just getting out to protest on their own. And as is the nature of things, anytime we're going to get a whole lot of people under the same umbrella for any single cause, in this case, racial justice, we are going to see differences of opinion amongst them and between them and lots of conflict going on. Um, even right now, the Republicans can't figure out their own version of what the next relief bill is going to be. And that's a much smaller group with a much closer ideology. So um, I am 
unsurprised that we're going to have dissent. Um, dissent is, uh, it's, it's healthy, it's democratic. It's also, in, in, in my years of studying the left, also quite common to have uh, within the left. Well, you know, we had Martin Luther King and others, but especially Mar Martin Luther King, who surfaced as the leader of the black movement at the time um, and effective while he was living. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, for Black Lives Matter, wouldn't it be better if there was a distinguishable leadership? Because right now, there really isn't. Even, even the guy who had some, um, some participation in, in creating the movement, he, he sort of denies that he's the leader. So who's the leader and would it be better if there were a leader? That's a great leadership question. And I, I actually think movements are more powerful in a, in a strange way if they lack leadership because Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., due to the forcefulness of his personality and leadership was able to galvanize and bring in folks. And while that's great for him, um, it's a challenge, of course, for the movement after his tragic assassination. When you have a movement that's embodying an ideal that so many people from so many places all want and are willing to rally, um, and, and whether they're moving through the legal process or, or in the streets protesting, um, is a kind of energy which is not limited or rooted to a single particular leader as well. Of course, we are going to, fo um, and, and I think this is also generational. I think the generation coming of age now is much more into a leader list kind of thing. And as I've been watching some of the social protest movements uh, happening among sort of the millennial generation, they're now struggling with the idea that at a certain point, you need a leader, you need a focus, you need an actual platform that everybody agrees on, and they're wrestling through the tensions. But as an historian, the idea that we can have a leaderless movement is in and of itself a significant development. And I think in terms of bringing change far more effective in terms of convincing even politicians that this is something they have to pay attention to, because it's not like you can bring someone into the office and try to make a deal with them and have them tell everybody to pipe down. This, this is something that, that is, is far bigger. But let me, let me throw this at you. <laughs> this this uh, leaderless movement um, query whether it's sustainable in the face of, a, of, of, of resistance, if you will, or attempts to break, break it up by, by Trump and his friends uh, and his police. Um, is it as sustainable as a movement with a leader? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, the other, the other double-edged sword I would, I would bring into the conversation is social media. These days, you can't have a social, uh, you can't have a social movement without social media. And right now, this moment, uh, 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 Mark Zuckerberg is testifying uh, in Congress today um, on, or is it tomorrow? It's soon um, on on exactly what his social media does and and what their mm, you know political direction or their free speech direction is and what their influence is from Trump. These are big questions, and uh, they have two to three billion um, followers, and many of them are in the United States. And right. although they may why... not be. Yeah, go ahead. That's one of the reasons the um, comment about being leaderless is really less relevant today. Because just certainly there are leaders on social media. We know that. People who tweet out, regardless of the partisanship or the position, and they are the de facto leaders. So I, I agree entirely, Mark, that uh, Trump can't call in MLK Jr. As, as Johnson did. Okay, but that works both ways. <laughs> that also works because uh, MLK Jr. can then go back and say, I didn't get what I wanted. And I'm going to I'm going to march. So I think there are, there are leaders, but our model of leadership is different now. Now, part of the frightening part of that is, uh, as we know from the two extremes, the leaders are invisible to a great degree on the dark web. Uh, many of the people providing information are are not recognizable, uh, not public figures per se. So I think there is uh, there is a certain amount of leadership. As far as the historical comparison, and Mark can correct me, but I think one of the major differences between uh, Black Lives Matter as an African-American movement and the John Lewis MLK Jr. generation is the lack of role of the Black churches. The Black churches played a critical role in the civil rights uh, movement. Um, and I think that the leaders were there for now. You can see in the language, the language continues to be the language essentially of uh, African-American interpretations of the Bible. The language is there. 
uh, but the key religious figures. Uh, and finally, uh, there were lots of major issues. Uh, I think when we talk about competition for leadership, I think if you went back and looked at the comments MLK Jr. made about Malcolm X and Malcolm X made about MLK Jr., uh, you would recognize, as Marx said, uh, don't worry so much about the people marching towards you, look to the left and the right. Those are the people you need to, to worry about. So the idea that somehow there is an absolute black unity, uh, first of all, that's in a sense a kind of racist comment as if Africans should have more unity than anybody else, which is not true, right? Uh, but it's also true that uh, there was no single uh, leader who uh, could speak for the entire movement. I remember John, John Lewis broke from his allies to become part of MLK Jr.'s movement. So the idea, I mean, Mark's right, the idea of dissent and disagreement, uh, we, the left is notorious for it, uh, but the right, remember, had the Tea Party. Uh, Tea Party drove Boehner from power. So the right has its own, you know, uh, kind of extremist, extremist groups. I think social media, though, is essential in organizing, in warning for both sides, right? It's like the printing press in the 16th century. Sure, you could use the printing press to attack the crown, but the crown could also use the printing press. Uh, one of the major differences is the government has censorship power, not legally, but you, you see that's really what's going on on the Hill, right? Is that Congress is passing the buck. And I don't, and Adam Smith would tell you, you know, don't ask businessmen to censor themselves. Businessmen have their own, their own interests. And to, uh, to ask Mark Zuckerberg to censor uh, his social media is really the senators and the Congress uh, saying essentially, uh, we don't really like free speech, uh, but we don't have the cojones to do something about it. So you do something about it. It's another example of failed oversight in our society. It's like asking a coal miner, should the should coal mine owner determine the health and benefits of the coal mine? Yeah. No. Yeah. The government should determine the health and benefits of the coal mine. So the problem I wonder, is we have an undereducated, you know, community out there who is affected by hate speech. And nobody calls it on, on social media. Maybe Twitter to some extent. But, but certainly Twitter doesn't do that. But well, why, because why? it affects people. It affects people who are undereducated. Um, so what you have, what you have is yes, it's a free for all. And just look at that historically. May I use that term? Uh, over the past few years, Not with me. social <laughs> media has been social media. <laughs> social media has been a real problem in turning what might be a rational response into an irrational one. Because there's so much. You know, I see some of it in my role as a moderator on YouTube. Um, but there's an awful lot of really explicit hate speech out there. And it's anonymous. Now, if we had anonymous kind of, you know, you, you know who you're dealing with, that might be better because that person would know that you know. But so what, 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 de what defines hate speech? How would you define hate speech? Oh, how much time you have? No, I mean, it's, it's seriously, this is, and this is connected to our issue. Mark and I talked about, you know, Farrakhan and whether or not an African-American athlete can say something on Twitter. You know, uh, Europeans have a saying, uh, censors strike twice. People are anxious to censor right now. And by censoring right now, you're setting a really bad precedent. Censorship may not be what we're really talking about. You, I mean, okay. It's just commenting on it. If, if Twitter can comment, then so can Mark. That's my view. But let's, let's, let's go right. to Mark. One sure. thing that Peter said, which was very, very interesting, is to point out the distinction between civil rights before uh, black civil rights, which involved uh, the churches. They were a very important part of Martin. He was a minister himself. Um, and now, which they're, they're kind of absent. Uh, what does this mean? How did this happen? Why are they not involved? I, oh, first of all, I, I would. I think that the black church is involved. I think what we're seeing, though, are two different kinds of movements. One that was much more centered around the black church with clergy and leadership positions, like Dr. King, Jesse Jackson, and others. Even Farrakhan, if you go, and Malcolm mm -hmm. X, if you go to the Nation of Islam. Um, and what we have now is a much more broad-based movement, which is expanding beyond the church uh, to in, to include you know, multi-generational as it's going. Uh, I think the fundamental difference between the movement prior to the mid 60s and the movement now, at least for white liberals, has been the shift from legal um, racism to systemic or extra legal racism. And that is, it's really, in a certain, as tough as it was in the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. years to achieve the goals they did and, and those who suffered and died for it, 
all they were trying to do was change a law on the books through the Jim Crow system. And they did this in 64 with the Civil Rights Act and in 65 with the Voting Rights Act. And when this happened, we could almost retire the classic interracial, interfaith, King Heschel marching arm in arm idea. And at this point with the rise of black nationalism, black power movement, and a sense that the much bigger job is ahead, which is how do we deal with the racism interwoven into society? And we'll start with affirmative action, which most of the Jewish organizations in the country supported, but then it got to quotas and busing, and this is where white Jewish liberals split and backed off. And then at that point- So Mr. Seeing, saying this is a dynamic, you mentioned 1964, that was the Mississippi Freedom Ride in which two Jewish young men were killed, uh, Goodman and Schwerner, um, yeah, and gave, their, gave their lives yeah. for the cause. And I would imagine that what you're really saying is at that time, it was a pure support, both ways, uh, you know, black to Jewish and Jewish to black. And after that, well, things got more complicated. Can you talk about where, where it's gone and where it is today? Well, first, I have to go back and say it was still complicated back even in the 1950s, and it wasn't actually everybody, <laughs> right? Um, so those Jews that went south uh, for in Freedom Summer and, and, and to register voters are my definition of, of historical heroes, which for me is a person who risks their own power, privilege, or even health or life for the benefit of another. The irony, um, which is not an irony if you look at it historically, there's an inverse relationship between level of ritual observance for the Jews who went down and the intensity of their work, which means the Orthodox whom you would imagine would be in the lead if this was a Jewish thing to do, were all but absent. Conservative movement, not much other than Rabbi Heschel and a few others, certainly. The reform movement of the denominations did best, but honestly, and since I have tenure, I can, and I'm a professor, I'll say this, there were Jewish socialists and communists out there, and they were radically disproportioned, and many of them were anti-religion. So we had a situation develop where we had some young activists engaged in righteous work and a whole lot of northern liberals living in segregated neighborhoods and homes in school districts without official Jim Crow who waited until, let's say, the early 70s before these questions came home to them. And when they did, they discovered they were a lot more, lots more similar to the white Southern Jews who had a similar disposition in the 50s, at least not supporting a public civil rights movement. Ah, very, very interesting. Okay. So here, so let me just add one thing. Can I, can I add two? Can I add two things? Like, uh, go ahead. Go two ahead. two yeah. things. Okay. Um, from my perspective right now, and, and, and Mark, I, I'm not uh, disagreeing with you, but I, I think uh, the legal question is a little more complicated because actually what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years is a much different strategy. And that strategy is the book, the rules and the laws are on the books. Now the tough work is in enforcing and protecting them. And that is still a fundamental issue. So for example, uh, the voting rights bill has not changed, but over 40 years, the court has decided to interpret it differently. So one of the continuities I look at would be the work done by African-American lawyers and the work done by the ACLU, which hasn't really changed very much in the sense that we get a law passed and we need to ensure. And if you look at a lot of what is going on, uh, it is an attempt to bypass, dilute, redefine the laws that do exist. So I think actually the problems remain very similar. It is, but in, to some degree, whether or not people have given up because of the attitude that, well, the law was passed. And that's a very, there's a nice little analogy. Sure, England outlawed the slave trade and the Royal Navy spent the next 40 years rescuing almost half a million people on slave boats. You know, the problem is you pass the right laws, you need to ensure they're enforced. And I think that's a great difficulty and that is where the legacy of Mitch McConnell and the legacy, most importantly, of, of Richard Nixon lie in the federal uh, judiciary. Um, and I think that's an important word. So I agree with you that some of the issues have changed, but really the fundamental issues. Now, the other fundamental issue is to remove laws that are unfair. 
And uh, my final point, I think, would be about the, the leadership, et cetera. Um, and I, I agree you're right that churches as churches, you know, participate. Um, what interests me is um, the sense of self-identification, like uh, in your reference to the Orthodox or the Conservatives or Reform. Um, once we ask the question, should I do this because I am Jewish, we're already biasing the answer. And if the question is, should I do this because I am Jewish, you cannot fault the Orthodox. The Orthodox live in their own world. They live separate from the Goyim. It is, live, it is separate but equal. It's Plessy v. Ferguson. The difficulty, right, is for the reform American Jew, and he or she has to decide, uh, where is Jewishness in that identity? And where is Jewishness in the motivation? So with all due respect, Jay, I would say, you know, I, I don't put Goodwin and Cherner up necessarily as Jewish heroes. I agree with Mark, they're historical heroes, uh, as members of humanity and young members of a generation, regardless of whether. So if we start asking, are you going to do this because you're Jewish, then we're playing the identity game. Well, I, I want to go, I want to go to an experience I had this morning. Okay. I, I went on Google, not to say that Google is to be all end all, and I typed in Black Lives Matter anti-Semitism. That those words, that's all. And what I got was, was dozens and dozens of pages and millions of hits on that. This is a conversation that is ubiquitous now. Uh, and it has started, it started, you know, in, in, in this great u ubiquitousness only a few years ago. Um, and I just like to ask you guys, what's going on? Why is there, why are there claims by the Jewish community that Black Lives Matter is anti-Semitic? And why is yeah. there proof that Black Lives Matter and some of its constituents have made really the most horrendous anti-statement, anti-Semitic statements, like Jews kill babies. How about that? On signs at these protests. So I see we have uh, one, minute, one minute left. Can we reschedule this and re do it again? No, we'll take you can't a few answer, you can't we'll answer a few that in 45 minutes. seconds. You can't. So, so, well, let me get on with it. So, so Mark, what, what's going on? Uh, so uh, I was honored to be on a panel with Eric Ward, the famed civil rights leader, just two days ago. And he, and by the way, this is the number one question I get all the time, and I <laughs> loved his answer. The cause of anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. Everywhere it happens, anywhere it happens, the cause of anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. There will be anti-Semitism in Black Lives Matter. There'll be anti-Semitism outside of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and to, to have sort of a group libel uh, a statement on, on, a, on a slogan, because there are some cases of anti-Semitism, while accurate on those some cases, actually is missing the point of, of both anti-Semitism and the anti-racism work. And I would only add that, apropos of your comment before, Jay, some of the attacks on Black Lives Matter are exactly bots and hate speech and unfounded. So oh, I that's you, totally, you, totally true. Yeah, and, and it's really an sorry to see the contention. I'm, I'm very well, sorry. To as see that as historians, so I'm happy. I mean, I think I don't want to speak for Mark, but I'm happy to wrestle with it. But the fact that it's out there uh, should suggest to you uh, some kind of political background as well, um, and that. What do you uh, mean by that? Uh, but I mean by that is it focusing on anti-Semitism in the Black Lives Matter can be a rational, reasonable discussion. Just like Mark says, anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party, anti-Semitism in the Republic, all those are reasonable. But we have to ask why the focus, uh, who's presenting it, uh, what the examples are. And it seems to me uh, that it's gone into the rumor and conspiracy mill uh, to undermine a movement and to try to distract from the movement. Now, that doesn't mean it's not there. And I'd love to talk to Mark about, you know, where it's there, why it's there. I, I think Farrakhan plays a significant role historically in the Nation of Islam, but not every African American is affiliated with the Nation of Islam. Farrakhan doesn't speak for every African. Nobody speaks for every African American. So you could eat just as easily, you know, say, um, anti-Semitism in uh, X movement. And you have to ask why that's focused, right? 
Does that? This is such a rich topic, Mark. You want to come well, back? Well, it is talk a rich topic, it? and I and I want to I want to mark uh, mark. I, I and, like and, the, and, the, and the deep part is that the deep part of this is that conversation we're just having right now is actually em emblematic of 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 another other conversations around race in America, which is actually what we're talking about, even though we don't think we're talking. Yeah, about it. let's let's do this again. Yeah, Mark, are you, you're willing to come back and uh, we'll do, uh, oh, gee whiz, a half an hour just on this specific topic. And I know we won't finish then either. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could do, you know, we could do race and anti-Semitism. I mean, I don't think it's important to necessarily target the African-American community. Uh, I know. White, I white, know. Whites, whites are allegedly a race and there's plenty of white anti-Semitism, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, Mark, I want to I want to just offer you the last minute here to sort of summarize your thoughts about what we've been discussing and uh, you know how far we got here. Yeah, so I'm an historian, and I'm normally thinking 50 year horizons because I study mostly the 60s. Um, with the pandemic, we're on a 100 year horizon around racial reckoning. We're going back to Reconstruction, the end of Reconstruction in 1877. Um, for me, the gift as an academic historian in this moment is knowing that we're living history every second we're living it and not understanding what our successors are going to say about us and what this ultimately means. So I'm really curious to see how this all plays out. Yeah, and it will play out, it'll change. Between the time of now and when we meet again, things will change. So we'll have plenty of material, right, Peter? Absolutely, I'm gonna send Mark his shirt. All right, Mark? <laughs> what's, your favorite, what's your favorite color? Oh uh, yeah, I, 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 you're looking good, anything light we, nice. we, Well, this is the only way Jay and I recognize each other. Otherwise, <laughs> we, would, you know, we, would, we would not recognize each other. But Mark, thank you very much. I know it's late in the day there, and. You're a very busy man, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank Peter you, Peter Hoffenberg. Thank you, Mark Dolling. I really appreciate it. Aloha.